Hello. Those words relentlessly extolling the virtues of extermination are synonymous with the Daleks, undoubtedly Doctor Who's perennial favourite monsters. And here at the Museum of the Moving Image, there's a permanent Dalek exhibit. The creatures were devised by writer Terry Nation in 1963. Here's how he described them in the script of The Daleks, the second adventure in Doctor Who's history. Hideous, machine-like creatures. They are legless, moving on a round base. They have no human features. A lens on a flexible shaft acts as an eye. Arms with mechanical grips for hands. The creatures hold strange weapons in their hands. As a kid, I had grown up watching movies and was always vaguely disappointed because I knew the monsters were people, really dressed up people. And so my first requirement was to make the, my monster non-humanoid. I didn't want it to look like somebody dressed up in a funny costume. So I had to eliminate the legs. And I had recently been to a concert of the Georgian state dancers. Now these are these very stately ladies who wear skirts right down to the floor and appear to glide. They just move. You don't see their feet going at all. So I thought that's the movement I want to achieve, this gliding effect and no legs involved. And then the voice, uh, it had to be a non-humanoid voice coming out of a computer. And I made a few mistakes. Uh, it would have been easier had I given them more manipulative hands. They were always a problem. When they wanted to pass things to one another, they were terrible problems. Uh, so basically, with those requirements, that's what happened. That's how the Dalek evolved. The Dalek's actual design was executed by BBC staff scenic designer Raymond Cusick. The designer who was actually scheduled to work on it uh, was a person called Ridley Scott, who, used, who then worked for the BBC. In fact, he worked on the next drawing board to me. But he wasn't, he wasn't free to do the filming. And uh, for continuity reasons, they needed the same designer for the filming and the studio. So he was dropped, and I was chosen, because I happened just to be free. I, I was spare, as it were. The Daleks, well, the first thing is, designers who design sets don't normally design visual effects, special effects, etc. They don't normally do that. There are designers who do that. But on the early Doctor Who's, uh, the designers had to do both. That's Barry Newbury, the other designer, and myself. We had to design all our special props, special effects, and so on. We, in other words, it's twice the amount of work. So what I used to do, I used to work furiously in the office designing all the sets, and in the evenings at weekends, I used to design all the special effects. And the actual Dalek was conceived on a Saturday night and finally designed on a Sunday afternoon at home. The Dalek's first appearance was somewhat limited, albeit deliberately. All that was seen was one of its limbs, yet it produced one of the best cliffhangers in the show's history. The Daleks, episode one, The Dead City. Needless to say, the audience was wrapped with anticipation at what was at the other end of that limb. The following week, on the 28th of December, 1963, we finally got to see a Dalek in all its glory. Do you think they really are just machines? What do you mean? Well, I was going to say, do you think there's someone inside them? <laughs> well, I was inside them. Quite often. For many years, in fact. The Daleks fitted me or I fitted the Daleks. One could only be about my height. You sat inside, no floors, so your feet were the motive power. They were on ball casters. You were like a little bubble car at the fairground. You sat there, the top was then placed on. In the top was the famous eye stick, which waddled around saying exterminate or exterminate. Two lights which flashed for your voice. Uh, often you could have a smoke canister underneath the seat with a pipe going through which you could control with one hand. Uh, you did your eyes with the other hand. Uh, you did the smoke or explosions with your third hand. And as you see, quite often it would have helped had the Dalek operators had four hands in there. Yeah, well, I've done quite a lot of voice work with uh, Peter Hawkins, um, a very good voice man and actor. And he gave my name to one of the directors of Doctor Who, I think, when voices were wanted. And so I turned up not knowing what was going to happen, and that's how it happened, I'm delighted to say.
I hadn't designed anything like it before, so it was a question of feasibility, money. I mean, I was given a budget, but I had no idea how far this budget would go. Um, so I did some early sketches and showed them to the, uh, the model maker, Shawcraft Models, in fact. And uh, they, they said, well, it is possible if you had about 10 times as much money. So from that point on, the designs became modified. The Daleks turned Doctor Who into an overnight success with over 8 million viewers and a second story was commissioned for the following season. The six-part adventure was once again written by Terry Nation and called The Dalek Invasion of Earth. Here's how the BBC trailed the story. The year is 2000. The place, London. The invasion of the Daleks has begun. Their plan to destroy all Earthmen. Work must proceed to schedule. There must be no delays. You will follow me, both of you. Do not try to escape or you will be exterminated. There will be no revolution. The Daleks are masters of Earth. See the Daleks in Doctor Who. The, the problem with the Dalek outside the studio, the, the Dalek inside the studio ran on uh, rubber tight casters, which was great for the flat studio floors. But on locations with bumpy pavements, etc., um, they rattled like an old biscuit tin. And so Shawcraft models went back with the, the designer on it, because uh, I didn't design it, I think the designer was Spencer Chapman, um, went back to uh, an idea of mine of using uh, pneumatic tires, small pneumatic tires. Not a tricycle, which was my original idea, um, but pneumatic tires, which meant um, deepening the skirt on the bottom to, to accommodate these wheels. Yes, yeah. the forces of creation. Yes, they dare. We have got to dare to stop them. The Daleks have invaded the Earth. Don't miss Doctor Who, the new science fiction series. You land that ship, the TARDIS, on a planet. And from that moment on, everything on that planet is your creation. If the rocks talk, nobody can deny it because you say, that's what they do on my planet. If the creatures have 12 eyes and 16 arms, fine, because it's my planet, I've made it. And so you have this wonderful freedom to do almost anything you want because it's your world and nobody can deny it. They all get rather mixed up in my tired old mind. Uh, we went all over the world, all over the universe. The top of the Empire State Building at one point, uh, the pyramids of Egypt at another. We even landed on the Marie Celeste and everybody jumped overboard. That is the answer as to why it was found empty. The Daleks had done it, you see. Less than a year later, Terry Nation wrote another Dalek script, a 12-part adventure of which only two whole episodes still exist, the Dalek Master Plan. The year is 4000 AD, the planet is Kemble, and the Doctor, Stephen and Katerina have joined forces with space security agent Brett Bayon in an attempt to warn the Earth of a Dalek plan to attack it and acquire the solar system, and thence the entire universe, taking the vital Terranian element with them. The time travelers escape from Kemble in the space yacht of Mavic Chen, the corrupt guardian of the solar system. The vehicle is forced down on the planet Desperus for repairs, and we join the story for the only remaining material of episode four. During the flight from Desperus, where Katerina is in trouble with a killer called Kirkson. Well, as you may have gathered, Katerina sacrifices herself to save the others. And even when our heroes reach Earth, they aren't safe. Fellow space security agent Sarah Kingdom, played by Jean Marsh, shoots down Brett Vion, erroneously convinced by Mavic Chen that he is the traitor. Episode five, the Dalek master plan, counterplot. 
The Doctor, Stephen and Sarah escape from Myra in the Daleks' own craft, where the Doctor makes a mock-up of the Terranium core. Once it is handed over to the Daleks on Kemble, the time travellers escape to the planet Tigus, pursued by the Doctor's old enemy, the meddling monk. His first plan thwarted, he follows them to ancient Egypt, and so do Mavic Chen and the Daleks. Episode 10, Escape Switch. The Doctor does arrive at the planet Kemble, where he rescues the imprisoned representatives of the galaxies. They warn the universe of the Daleks' monstrous ambitions, and the Daleks exterminate Mavic Chen. The Doctor manages to activate the Time Destructor, and the Dalek force is wiped out, as Sarah ages rapidly and dies. As the Doctor resumes his travels, the vegetation of Kemble has been reduced to dust. I remember being extremely busy. Um, dashing around, filming at Ealing and so on. And I remember the director, Douglas Canfield, and who ran the whole thing like a military operation. And, um, for instance, I remember one afternoon in the studio, he said, uh, it's 22 and a half minutes past three, so we should be on shot 52. And, uh, and he used to call me Major. He said, uh, that would be your rank if this was a military operation. And he was Colonel Canfield. The, the thing I do remember was the filming uh, at Ealing with all the uh, model spaceships, which apparently they still managed to get a bit of the film. That was quite a large model. That was, must have been about uh, 30 foot square, built up on Rostrum. It was quite big. Two cinema films involving the Daleks were made in the 60s, Doctor Who and the Daleks, and The Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD. Your bomb is designed to slide down this shaft, strike a fracture in the Earth's inner surface, and so release the magnetic core of our planet. But the fracture is near the meeting point of the magnetic influence of the North and South Poles. One mistake, one deviation in the aiming of your bomb, and enough magnetic energy will be released to destroy you. There will be no mistake. These prisoners are to be exterminated. One moment. You must listen to me. If you spare us, I can help you. I can show you how to neutralize this magnetism so that your plan can be carried out without danger to yourselves. Sir, Section Rover Man 9 has ordered halt. Speak quickly. But I, I'll show you. Look! Attention, all Robermen! Attack the Daleks! Everyone was rushing around corridors at Threshold House, um, saying, oh, there's going to be Dalek films, there's going to make Dalek soap and Dalek tea towels. You know, everyone had visions of um, lots of money. Um, I was quite friendly then with Terry Nation and uh, we appeared on a very famous show on BBC Two called Late Night Lineup and I remember asking him after the show, um, you know, what about the films Terry? And he said, well, leave it to me, you know. And I never saw him again. Twenty years later the Daleks were still making news when an enthusiastic Dalek was given an award on the Noel Edmonds show for overacting. Here from an outtake from the Five Doctors story is the reason why. What actually happened, the director called down to me and I was, in this particular time, happened to be sitting behind the flat on the set and said, we'd like what they call a wild track. They'd like a wild track of Dalek noise with him getting rather emotional and excited, shouting exterminate and going a little bit bananas. And they also had a, a Dalek, wanted a Dalek to move around in camera so they could take this and edit into one of the programmes. So uh, I started to do this. Um, I was on cams, I could hear the box, the director upstairs, and I heard he answered the phone, but I was in the middle of doing this, so I had to carry on because the camera was running and sound was running. And he was on the phone for the best part of a minute, and the Dalek was getting higher and higher and higher until I didn't know where else to go, and suddenly the phone, he, he 
came down to me on my cans and said, I'm terribly sorry, Roy. And so I said, thank you and for an encore. <laughs> so this is how that happened. The creature inside um, was a mutation. There had been this uh, a war, nuclear war, between the Thals and the Dals. And uh, whereas the Thals had survived, um, the, the Dals had mutated into something horrible. And we, we Verity Lambert, the producer, and, and the director, Chris Barry, we sat down and we said, well, they, they logically, over the years, developed artificial limbs and so on. So gradually, they, they ended up with a, an entire machine uh, surrounding them. They were just a sort of brainy blob that, that, that lived in, in the center of this, this uh, machine. Editorially, it was decided that the thing would never be shown. Although I was asked by a magazine, Titbits, if um, I could sort of illustrate it, which I did. After the Dalek master plan completed transmission on the 29th of January 66, William Hartnell appeared in eight more stories before his regeneration into Patrick Troughton. And who else but the Daleks were chosen to launch the new Doctor in his first adventure? This six-part story sadly no longer exists, except for this brief excerpt from episode four of The Power of the Daleks. It was brief. The Power of the Daleks and The Evil of the Daleks, less than six months later, were written by the original script editor of Doctor Who, David Whittaker. Evil was a seven-part adventure, and only episode two remains. The Doctor's TARDIS has been stolen, and his investigations lead him to an antique shop specializing in Victoriana. Needless to say, lurking at the back of the shop is, well, just guess. Terrific stuff. The Doctor defeats the Daleks, of course, by humanizing some of them and causing civil war on the Dalek planet Skaro, to which everyone is transported. Maxtable, having been Dalekized, is killed, and Victoria's father dies, saving the Doctor's life. The orphaned Victoria joins the Doctor and Jamie on their travels. There was one very funny moment happened. It was in a program called Evil of the Daleks. Uh, the Doctor had invented the machine which if a Dalek passed through, it changed his whole personality. Um, he became a nice, good, kind, caring thing or person. And so Peter Hawkins and myself decided, uh, with the director's agreement, that once they'd been through this, we would alter how the Daleks spoke. Instead, as I mentioned before, that instead of going on one level or rising, we let them go up, up and down like this, so they became more normal. But we were running very, very behind time on this day, and the director was a very good director, I hasten to add, but I'd become very tense, and the whole studio was not terribly happy. We were all a little bit nervous and edgy, and something needed to break it, so when Alpha and Beta, I was playing a Dalek called Beta, and Peter Hawkins was doing the voice for a Dalek called Alpha. When they went through this machine, I was meant to say to Alpha, Alpha, what has happened to us? And what I actually did was say, What's it all about, Alpha? <laughs> Which was a pop song at the time. Um, the director went a little bit bananas, but the studio laughed and everything ended up happily. Biddy Baxter, the producer of Ruby, they phoned me up and asked me, she had a brilliant idea. Um, children were writing into her about Doctor Who, and uh, had I any ideas about making a play suit for um, you know, a small amount of money, 10 shillings, she mentioned. Um, so I thought about it. Um, mind you, I was busy on the program. I didn't have much time to consider. Uh, so I, I enlisted the help of Bill Roberts, who, who made the actual dialect. And, he came up to the centre for lunch and we chewed about it over some napkins and drew some things with egg boxes and bits of cardboard and so on and uh, sprayed silver across. And uh, he came up with something which was brilliant. And uh, this was presented on um, Blue Peter by Chris Trace, the, the then presenter, who, who said in front of um, all the children, millions one assumes, much to the annoyance of Billy Baxter, I think, that Ray Cusick should have a gold badge. And uh, I always thought you had to do things of valour to get a gold badge anyway. I got one. Number one Dalek, or head Dalek, as I've come to be known over the years, really because of the length of time I'm doing it, the other chaps who were doing it fell by the wayside or moved away or did other work. 
uh, whenever any new chaps came in, uh, it was amazing that you could tell them the best way to do a scene, the best way to sit, how to tie yourself in, how to find that you had three or four hands inside the Dalek to do this job, which looks impossible. Uh, directors and PAs, of course, thought the same thing. Get John to do it. Get John to organize this. We want four Daleks to come round this corner. How best to do it? And you almost had a folklore of which way you traveled, whether you were in echelon, who was giving the orders. This went on all the time. And you were number one Dalek, I'm afraid. Recently, some more material from the Dalek master plan came to light, but with no sound. To accompany the pictures, a sample of Dalek mania. I'm gonna spend my Christmas with a Dalek And hug him underneath the mistletoe And if he's very nice, I'll feed him sugar spice And hang a Christmas stocking from his big left toe And when we both get up on Christmas morning I'll kiss him on his chrome inflated head And take him in to say hi to Mum And frighten Daddy out of his bed Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I wish to be your friend. I used to give many interviews to the press, sometimes three or four a week, and um, oh, I was always misquoted, of course always. And uh, there was one famous uh, piece written by Nancy Banks Smith, who then wrote for The Guardian, TV critic. And uh, she, she interviewed me at the centre, television centre, and uh, she phoned me up actually. She said, uh, Ray, when you read the piece, don't be put out. I didn't write it. Ah, I said, what do you mean? She put it, it was taken off my desk and, and, and rewritten. And the, uh, the story, the basic theme of it was um, Ray Cusick, designer, and Terry Nation, writer. Here we have Terry Nation, uh, who's rags to riches. And here we have Ray Cusick, who's rags to rags. <laughs> that was the sort of theme of the piece. And um, they got very upset at the BBC and... Uh, I don't blame them, actually, but um, I didn't say all these things, of course. Patrick Troughton's story, Evil of the Daleks, in 1967, was the last appearance of the Daleks for quite a while, except for a brief cameo in the final episode of The War Games. But their notoriety was established, and when they reappeared for Day of the Daleks, the year was 1972. Another time, another place, and another doctor.